Well, just when we thought we were destined for a decent Christmas season with family and friends around the table and possibly even international travel, along comes this Omicron variant of COVID and everything now seems up in the air once more. Now, at this stage, Aussies, I think, will be hoping that cool heads prevail and certainly that a proportionate political response is applied. Adding strength to the argument that we need not panic here, though, is the fact that Australia is now a very heavily vaccinated nation. In fact, over 92% of us have had our first dose, and when I checked last night, almost 87% are now double vaccinated, which is up there among the best numbers in the world. But as those numbers suggest, there are still, obviously, a number of Australians that either haven't or simply won't get vaccinated. Now, that is their right. Uh, That was always going to be the case. But it hasn't stopped some suggesting that we at least try to use either a carrot or a stick to get the Remainers over the line. Now, a while ago, the Grattan Institute, for example, recommended a $10 million weekly lottery. The former New South Wales Premier Bob Carr took a slightly different tact, recently suggesting that Australia should follow the approach of Singapore, where, put simply, the non-vaccinated are made to cough up for their own COVID-related treatment costs. Now, another person adding their thoughts to this is the economist Saul Eslake, who said yesterday that there are many cases in which people are required to pay more due to choices that they make that affect others, and that this principle should also apply to the vaccine issue. He made the point that non-vaccinated people could, for example, pay a higher Medicare levy in the same way as those who earn above a certain level have to pay more for Medicare if they choose not to take on private health. Well, it's a controversial suggestion, uh, but there would be some that agree. Saul Eslake joins me on the program. Good morning to you, Saul. Good morning, Michael, and thank you for having me on your program again. That's my pleasure. I assume if you have Twitter, you haven't checked the responses today. Oh, yes, I have. Um, It's... it's Interesting, the variety of responses. I mean, as you say, it's a controversial proposal, and I note that the government has rejected it. So to some extent, it's a bit moot now. It's clearly not going to be taken up this side of the election, and it may not be taken up the other side, even if there's a change of government. But Uh, If I look at the reactions to it, um, the commenters on the article where it was originally published in what we used to call the Fairfax Papers were, I think, overwhelmingly in favour. Most of the comments on Twitter and in other media outlets were rather more critical. Um, I received a bit of fan mail myself, most of it from people who didn't have either the courtesy or the intestinal fortitude to put their names to what they wrote. And when I tried to reply to some of them, not surprisingly, the emails bounced because they'd provided a false email address. Um, You know, that's the nature of these things, and I'm not particularly fussed about it. You know, I'm not questioning the right of people to refuse to take vaccines. You know, this is not a dictatorship. People should not be obliged to have things put into their bodies that they're not comfortable putting them there. But in my view, the evidence from those who know what they're talking about is overwhelmingly that vaccines do reduce the chance that if you happen to get the virus, you will need hospital treatment at cost to taxpayers. And given that that is the overwhelming consensus of informed opinion and that the majority of Australians, as you said before, have accepted that and come forward to be vaccinated, if some people choose, as they're entitled to, not to be vaccinated, knowing that that increases their risk of needing hospital treatment if they get COVID. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask that they make an income-related contribution to the additional costs which they are effectively imposing on all other taxpayers by choosing not to be vaccinated. Now, if they have a medical reason for not being vaccinated, they could be exempt from that. I'm not questioning that. But it is very similar to the policy that was initially introduced by the Howard government and has been continued by subsequent governments of both political persuasions that while you're not forced to take out health insurance, if you have the financial capacity to do so and choose not to, you're in effect choosing to 
impose an additional burden on other taxpayers through the publicly funded health system, and you're asked to make a contribution towards reducing that cost. And that's what I'm suggesting in this case. I don't agree with Mr Carr's suggestion that people who catch COVID and are unvaccinated should pay the full cost of their hospital treatment because that would clearly be unfair on people on low incomes who've chosen not to be vaccinated and can't afford to pay that treatment. But an income-related response through a Medicare levy surcharge, I think, would be a fair way of making those who have the financial capacity to look after themselves uh, make some contribution to the cost that they choose to impose on others by choosing not to be vaccinated. It's an interesting point you make there uh, because the Singaporean model is a catch-all, obviously, irrespective of one's income. What you're suggesting here would really only affect those who earn a certain amount of money and up. But what it wouldn't capture, therefore, are those who would, say, choose not to be vaccinated but are in the lower economic quartiles. So uh, assuming the majority, it's just an assumption, but let's assume the majority of those who choose not to be vaccinated are in those quartiles. What difference would this idea make? Well, not very much. And it's not really intended to make a huge difference. I mean, I don't kid myself that it's going to raise a lot of money. It's not a means of repairing the budget, as the article that initially reported my views implied in its headline. And I don't advocate it as a way of changing people's minds about whether to be vaccinated or not. I I don't know a lot of people who've chosen not to be vaccinated, but I assume that those who have made that choice have made it as a result of having thought about the pros and cons of vaccination. They may well have chosen to use sources that I wouldn't regard as credible, but they're entitled to take a different view. Um, So I'm not imagining that this is going to change a lot of people's minds as to whether or not to get vaccinated, but I think it is a legitimate expression of opinion on the part of the broader community that if people want to make choices like this that are different from those made from the majority of Australians, and if they're choices that do have a high probability of imposing additional costs on other Australians, then those people who have the capacity to, as a result of those choices, should bear some of the cost of the choices they make rather than offloading them onto everybody else. Yeah, I saw Deloitte's uh, Chris Richardson sort of buy into this and said, uh, where our choices affect others, we do tend to have higher taxes. And he pointed to tobacco excise, for example. Uh, But that's not a universal application either, is it? For example, you might have some diabetics uh, who choose to eat a lot of sugary foods, but uh, there's there's no sort of financial catch-all there. I mean, it's not really a principle in Australian taxation yet. Well, it's not uniformly applied, of course, but, uh, you know, it's been suggested from time to time that there ought to be a tax on sugar in order to make those who consume excessive amounts of it with adverse consequences for their health, make a financial contribution to the costs of treating those problems in the same way that we impose additional costs on smokers and heavy drinkers through excise taxes. But I would say this about diabetes, that if you get diabetes or if you are obese, that's not always a result of conscious choices that you make. There are genetic predispositions to having diabetes and to being obese. And you know, people often end up in that position because you've you know, things they've inherited from their parents rather than necessarily because they've made bad lifestyle choices. Whereas you know, no one forces you to smoke. No one forces you to drink excessive amounts of alcohol. You can become addicted, of course, and that's something that can be medically treated but in that sense I think diabetes and obesity are in a slightly different category from smoking and drinking I mean some people have also said that you know what do you do about people who choose to engage in risky sports like jumping out of airplanes or climbing rocks or riding bikes without helmets and so forth the connection between those choices and adverse health consequences that create costs for other taxpayers is much more tenuous than the evidence suggests is the link between choosing not to be vaccinated against COVID-19 and ending up in hospital. Look, what I'll do, I'll throw it to the audience. I'll see what they make of it. It'll be interesting in that the vast majority of people who are listening right now, based off the numbers that we have across the country, 
are double vaccinated. So, you know, no skin off their nose, irrespective of what anyone suggests. But that doesn't necessarily mean they'll agree with the principle. So it'll be interesting to see how people take to the idea. As you say, it won't happen this time of the election, well, this side of the election, because the, the government have ruled it out. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, I'm used over the course of my professional career of governments rejecting what I think are good ideas. You know, that's uh, that's by no means uncommon. But, you know, I still think uh, that it's important for these sort of propositions to be canvassed. And between now and election, I hope we'll have lots of open and honest conversations about potentially difficult issues. Whether that actually happens, of course, is another matter, but it's what I'd like to believe. Indeed, it wouldn't hurt if it did. Great to talk to you as always, Saul. Thank you. Not at all, Michael. Thank you very much, and good morning to you and your listeners. And to you. Saul Leslake, their independent consulting economist and commentator.